Good afternoon or good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, uh, you're all very welcome today to our guest lecture by uh, Nadia Abatova on the topic of Russia and the EU, a postponed partnership. Uh, my name is David Donahue, and I'm delighted on behalf of the Institute to welcome Nadia back to speak to us. She is a very distinguished Russian political scientist and commentator. She's currently head of the Department for European Political Studies at the Institute of World Economy and International Relations, in other words, IMEMO, which is part of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. Nadia has many other distinctions. She is the director of the discussion forum European Dialogues. She's vice president of the Russian Pugwash Committee. She's a member of Russia's Council on Foreign and Defense Policy. And she is the author of numerous articles and essays, including four individual publications on EU-Russian relations, European security, and Russia's foreign policy. And we're really delighted and honored to have her with us today. Nadia will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. She will discuss the current state of EU-Russia relations and uh, will argue that these relations have been shaped in particular by the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Um, she will also comment on how the post-Soviet space has been uh, has evolved into a, a zone of rivalry between Russia and the West generally. After she has made her presentation, we will move into a Q&A session. You'll be able to join this discussion via the Q&A function on Zoom, which you will see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please feel free to send in your questions and comments as they occur to you, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. And a couple of other housekeeping points. The entire event uh, is on the record, and you may also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So with that, I hand you over to Nadia. Nadia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, David, for your generous uh, introduction. Uh, let me express my gratitude to the Institute of International and European Affairs and personally to its director, Jill Donahue, for the opportunity uh, to present a Russian view, not the Russian, but a Russian view on the most uh, exciting topic, at least for me, the EU-Russia relations. Let me start with uh, two preliminary remarks. Uh, first, uh, relations between Russia and the European Union uh, after the collapse of the USSR have experienced many ups and downs, uh, more than once fi finding themselves on the edge of a crisis, but they have never been as bad as they are now. Russia is portrayed in the West as a revisionist state which violated the post-bipolar status quo, first in the Caucasus crisis in 2008 and then in Ukraine. Conversely, as seen in Russia, it is the West, European Union, and above all NATO that should be viewed as violators of international order. Uh, the question for our purposes is not so much who is right, but rather uh, the understanding uh, why it went wrong, as well as implications uh, of this deep disagreement. And my second remark is about uh, the method of my analysis. I would like to propose a layer by layer analysis of the Eurasia crisis leading from the superficial perception of problems to the origins of the current um, uh, disagreement. And uh, this method of an analysis can be called the matryoshka doll method. <laughs> so the first matryoshka, why it went wrong. Uh, the Ukraine conflict and particularly Kremlin's incorporation of Crimea are widely perceived uh, in the European Union and the West as a whole as a turning point in their relations with Russia. Unlike the Caucasus crisis of 2008, which from the very beginning was a clash uh, between Russia and uh, NATO, the conflict over Ukraine was triggered by the clash of two regional strategies, the EU Eastern Partnership and Russia's Eurasia 
project. Ukraine in both strategies was giving a central place. Different reference points can be named in the contradi contradiction over Ukraine. Um, first and foremost, Yanukovych's refusal under the pressure of Russia to sign an association agreement with the European Union. However, in my view, the turning point happened much earlier in 2012 with the return of Vladimir Putin to the presidency of the Russian Federation. Moscow changed the vector of its post bipolar evolution from European to Eurasian vocation and did not want Ukraine to go in the opposite direction. The economic and financial crisis in the West, and particularly in the EU, forced Vladimir Putin to conclude that Russia should no longer listen to the moralizing of the weakened EU who lost the right to lecture other countries on good governance. The point was that the economic modernization of Russia embodied in the partnership for modernization also required political modernization that uh, presented a threat in the eyes of Kremlin to the stability of Russia. Uh, the EU negative reaction to Putin's return to power in 2012 was another stimulus uh, for Kremlin's pivot to Eurasia. Putin decided that Russia should modernize its economy and uh, not relying on European uh, technological innovation, but by adopting a new industrialization plan based on modern uh, national technologies and the Eurasian Union. Looking back in time, we cannot but recognize that Russia's reaction to the EU Eastern Partnership uh, project was excessive. Moscow got the impression that Kiev signing the association agreement with European Union uh, would automatically um, bring Ukraine into European Union. But in fact, uh, Kremlin's negative reaction was not only about Ukraine's would the membership in European Union. The Russian leadership suspected that Eastern partnership was a smoke screen for NATO's expansion into the CIS space. In fact, NATO's um, eastward um, uh, enlargement strategy strongly and negatively influenced Russia's perception of the EU enlargement policy as uh, the leaders of both institutions uh, repeatedly emphasized that these two processes uh, were implementary. Uh, in the war with Georgia in 2008, Moscow, uh, we, um, Moscow drew a red line to NATO expansion to the sphere of Russia's influence. The same security considerations were at the heart of Russia's annexation of Crimea, although the example of Ukraine was different from the Georgian case. In the eyes of Russian political elite, um, after Moscow's tough response to Saakashvili, the West decided to change it tactics and put the European Union with its Eastern Partnership Program on the first flank in order to then open the way to NATO. Um, I would like to, qu to quote uh, the British agency writers commenting on the annexation of Crimea to the Russian Federation. Russia has long opposed NATO's eastward expansion as threatening its own security and says Kiev's plan to associate itself more closely with the West, including with the military alliance and the European Union, has forced it to react. Uh, aside from this, uh, there was a widespread myth that territorial conflicts in NATO's potential members would automatically remove this issue from the alliance's agenda. Nothing of this sort is contained in any official NATO document, but the myth has already played a very destructive role, having encouraged some leaders like President Saakashvili uh, to resolve 
um, territorial conflicts by force. And conversely, this myth has discouraged and still, still discourages Russia to contribute to peaceful resolution of the CIS conflicts. Because the logic is very simple. Why should we try to do our best if these countries uh, then will go to NATO? So in other words, both the Caucasus crisis and the Ukrainian conflict, which are widely viewed in the West as the main reason for the deterioration of the EU-Russia relation, are not the cause, but rather the consequence of deeper problems that stem from different views of Russia and the West about the acceptable foundations of post bipolar security in Europe and rivalry in the post-Soviet space. So now I'm approaching uh, the Matryoshka number two. Uh, the end of the bilateral confrontation brought up the question of the institutional foundation of the post uh, bipolar security. Uh, in the OSC was viewed by the Russian leadership as a security organization conceptually more adapted to new realities than NATO. The West proceeded from the different understanding uh, that in the post Cold War Europe, there, there was uh, no other organization than NATO which could do that job. Uh, after the end of bipolarity, NATO lost its uh, initial raison d'etre and found its mission in the process of enlargement. Uh, I put aside the question whether uh, a process can uh, substitute a goal, but I would say that NATO's um, newly found mission in the EU enlargement became a source of instability in uh, Europe. Paradoxically, NATO's military uh, campaign against Yugoslavia in 1999, conducted without uh, UN Security Council authorization, became the first act of the newly enlarged NATO, and this fact fueled uh, Russia's concerns about the real intention behind the alliance's expansion. This event, together with the US military operation in Iraq in 2003 and recognition of Kosovo's independence, um, changed Moscow's perception about the West-Russia partnership. It is also important to note a psychological uh, aspect of NATO's enlargement. Since uh, NATO strategy was, uh, was uh, uh, met, uh, was accepted, uh, was met uh, by Russia uh, with hostility, it cultivated a kind of confrontational climate that supported NATO in its traditional dimension. In all probability, if Russia had been part of the NATO enlargement policy, as well as Eastern uh, partnership over EU Caucasus and Ukraine crisis would never have happened. The lesson that we could draw from this experience is that as long as Russia shares the continent with European Union and NATO that possess a huge economic, technological, and military superiority over Russia, without Russia, will be always interpreted by Moscow as against Russia, and it will remain a source of instability in Europe. Another apple of discord um, was rivalry in the post-Soviet space. After the collapse of the USSR, European Union and NATO were focused mostly on the Central and Eastern Europe and on the return of these countries back to Europe. Uh, the post-Soviet space was not included in the EU post-communist strategy. Uh, neither European Union nor NATO were ready to sort out the mess in the post-Soviet republics, while Russia 
um, could not afford to stand aloof watching what was going on uh, in its immediate neighborhood. Therefore, uh, Russia's Western partners uh, uh, offered um, a pragmatic model for the uh, West Russia relation. Don't bother us in the CEE space, and we won't bother you in your backyard. Interestingly, although the West was concerned in general about Russia's new imperial uh, ambition, uh, it did not let uh, this uh, fact, Russia's uh, activities in the post Soviet space, spoil uh, relation with Moscow because the rest of Moscow foreign and domestic policy suited the West perfectly well, as it could sometimes in a very uneven and heavy handed way, Russia stabilized the CIA space having frozen a number of conflicts. But when the CIS was more or less stabilized and uh, European Union and NATO finished uh, their job in Central and Eastern Europe, they came up to the CIS piece. Uh, Matryoshka number three. In turn, this disagreement on the post bipolar security arrangements and rivalry in the CIS have also been a product of more fundamental phenomena, phenomenon, which I uh, call an even end of the bipolarity. Uh, usually when big uh, wars ended, uh, usually all big war ended with big peace conferences that established new world order, new rules of behavior for international actors. The end of the Cold War, which happened in November 1990, remember, ended with the Paris summit. But the USSR still existed in those days. The major changes happened only one year later, the end of bipolarity with the collapse of the USSR. And since it was uh, the USSR that collapsed, uh, this fact persuaded the West uh, of its rightness, and uh, they did not uh, feel uh, they did not feel any need to change uh, anything in their policy. So uh, the a new peace conference, a genuine post bipolar conference, did not take. Please. And uh, um, I would like to quote uh, uh, one prominent British strategic thinker, Lawrence Freedom, who observed in 1999 that Russia, Russia's weakness meant that it could not expect the privileges, respect, and extra sensitivity to its interests normally accorded a great power. It means that Russia was treated uh, by the West as a defeated country, very much like Germany and Japan after uh, the Second World War. Although Russia um, uh, and the USSR did not lose the Cold War. The USSR was created for the Cold War. It was its genuine environment and the USSR lost the time when Gorbachev started its rapprochement with the West, new political thinking, the Soviet construction fell apart. Uh, um, moreover, the post-bipolar euphoria of, uh, of the West uh, created uh, in the EU and NATO the impression that the old rules of behavior, namely the Helsinki principles that helped us survive the East-West confrontation, lost their importance. And they started to selectively apply these principles according to their ideological and political preferences. 
not surprisingly, uh, not, su uh, not surprising that Russia considered this new world order uh, with uh, suspicion and uh, the Munich speech of Vladimir Putin of 2007 was simply a reflection of contradiction that had been building for some time. It is necessary uh, to recognize that after the collapse of the USSR, Russia made its fair share of policy mistakes. You remember that uh, the USSR was dissolved at the stroke of a pen without any serious negotiation between the newly independent states about the Soviet uh, legacy about this, uh, the problems inherited from the USSR. And this fact largely predetermined uh, the uh, poor fate of the CIS and troubled relations between Russia and uh, it, its post Soviet neighbors. The later became clear when Russia plunged into never ending tensions with its neighbors over issues of territory economics, defense, and minorities. But I would like to note that Russia's neighbors were not only idle onlookers. Half-heartedly, they uh, accepted uh, the model of relations offered by Russia, uh, political loyalty uh, for economic bonuses. So nobody is perfect in this uh, post-Soviet uh, space, although I, I think that the bulk of responsibility for the missed opportunities rests with Russia. Now approaching the very core of the Matryoshka and the fundamental roots for the failed partnership between, between Russia and Europe, one cannot ignore the history of Russia's tragic internal evolution. The contradictory and dramatic history of Russia repeatedly led it away from Europe and created a fertile ground for various myths, ideological and political fabrications about its uniqueness, about special uh, Russian values, its special mission in the world. And it is quite understandable that the debate about the Russia's European vacation acquired um, an acute political meaning after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the entire communist system. Russia's historical drama, a European country in terms of its civilizational identity, lies in the fact that it was cut off from the rest of Europe by the Mongol yoke for 250 years protracted serfdom, the communist rule, and inconsistent reforms that predetermined its social economic backwardness. There exist many definitions of Russia. Some people would say that Russia is a Russian country. Others would say that it is a European Pacific country. Uh, it's a new Europe, but my definition is this one. Russia is late Europe, and Russia is lagging behind other European countries who, by the ever, passed through the same experience, but many years, if not centuries ago. What should be done? And let me start with the European, uh, with, with the strategy of the EU vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. I think that uh, EU is lacking a real efficient strategy which would be different from the famous uh, Borel's triad uh, based on pushing uh, Russia back containing Russia and engaging with Moscow at the same time. This strategy lacks any strategic goal. What is more important, containment or selective cooperation? It is impossible to keep 
the right balance between repulsion and interaction at the same time. Something should be more important than other, uh, the, uh, than um, another element. Aside from this, uh, Borel's definition of the EU foreign policy cannot but inspire anxieties. At the presentation of his book, um, European foreign policy in the time of COVID-19, he literally said, we must remember that foreign policy is about changing the domestic politics of other countries. What is foreign policy for us? Means domestic politics, pol uh, uh, policies for others. Uh, this understanding uh, of the EU foreign policy, um, in my view, is fraught uh, with new problems, uh, if not uh, new conflicts. First, the goal of the foreign policy of any state or coalition of states at all times has been to ensure the most favorable external environment for its functioning primarily through the strengthening of international stability and security. Of course, human rights can and should be part of the foreign policy agenda, but they cannot substitute other issues related to international and regional security, conflicts, um, fight against uh, proliferation of WMD, the arms control. Second, Barrel's position, in my view, is the retreat from the EU global strategy of 2016, which was the first realistic concept paper where the traditional rhetoric of promoting democracy had been replaced by the notion of resilience as the guiding principles of the EU relation with neighboring states. And third, changing uh, the domestic policy disaster. However beautiful European principles and norms may be, they cannot be imposed by force on unprepared societies since they will result in uh, counterproductive uh, trends. It will reinforce the opposite tendencies and reverse the democratic achievements that these uh, societies uh, reached um, in the last years. Nevertheless, in my view, there is a strong connection between the foreign policy interaction of states and positive internal political changes, but in my view, it is directly opposite to what Perel spoke about. The better the external environment for a state, the better its internal development. And let me remind you that uh, academician Andrei Sakharov, a well-known uh, philosopher and human rights, uh, human rights um, defender was returned from his exile in Gorky to Moscow only when Gorbachev and Reagan started a new rapprochement between, uh, between the countries. Uh, today, uh, Russia and the EU do not have a common, com common enemy like uh, in, in, in uh, the, like the one they had in the anti-Hitler coalition. Neither international terrorism nor the pandemic brought Russia and the West closer. Nonetheless, both Russia, European Union, NATO are facing a common and the most terrible threat, the threat of a global conflict which could happen because of the possible escalation of regional conflicts, incidents, and um, polit even political contradictions. In this regard, 
One cannot but recall the Eastern policy of Willy Brandt, his Ostpolitik. It was not aimed at democratic transformation of the USSR. It was aimed at strengthening European security uh, and uh, changes in uh, this security environment through rapprochement and reconciliation between West Germany and uh, the countries of the Soviet bloc. Something of this kind we need today. We should focus on one and probably the most uh, important, the most urgent problem for European security. In my view, this problem is absolutely obvious. It is peace in Ukraine. And Russia and European Union and probably the United States could uh, agree on, uh, on, uh, on the international peacekeeping operation in Ukraine in the corridor between Minsk I and Minsk II agreement and created the necessary precondition for political uh, solution of this conflict. And if we uh, succeeded in Ukraine, we could think about a genuine post-bipolar peaceful conference that would establish new rules of behavior for all countries. Thank you.